the British Bulldog, Davy Boy Smith, one of the most athletically gifted wrestlers in the history of professional wrestling. He could coast and put on a tremendous match, and most fans wouldn't even be able to tell. And even when he was at his lowest, he would just tell somebody, like Bret Hart, I'm fooked. Bret, I'm fooked. And he certainly achieved his dream, winning the Intercontinental Championship at Wembley Stadium in front of 80,000 fans, and he won it whether he wanted to or not. That kid, what a goddamn legend. And sure, British Bulldog, Davy Boy Smith, his life was cut tragically short at 39 years old. Every fan that watched him misses him to this very day. His family misses him, but what a legacy he left, even with the troubles that he had. I'm John Renton with my review, WWE on A&E Biography, WWE Legends on the British Bulldog. Davey Boy Smith, one hour, yeah, one hour. So much like the DDP episode, I'm going to talk about some things they left out, some stuff I like. And next week is Roman Reigns, and I think that's actually the end of the season. I wonder if they're going to do an hour-long episode on Roman Reigns. They really could do two hours and talk about various people that knock things about him and, you know, certain things that he was going through not being legit. But let's get back to the British Bulldog. One of my favorites, somebody that actually kept me in wrestling, and somebody I enjoyed when I first got into WWF television. Watching him and Dynamite Kid, don't worry, more on Dynamite Kid here in a bit. If you really want to know my thoughts on Dynamite Kid, you can check out my Dark Side of the Ring <coughs> review that I did on that particular episode. That is on the, you know, <clears throat> the documentary and Dark Side of the Ring reviews playlist. But Davy Boy Smith truly was athletically gifted. I just wish they could have done two hours, and I say it for this reason. They could have died into so much of his past, <clears throat> they didn't have to just skip over so much of his stuff, like on the British Indies. In Stampede. I'm not saying they need to spend a ton of time on that, but they skipped over so much stuff that he did, even in his second run, or actually, <laughs> technically, his, well, yeah, technically his second run, I mean, because they kind of flummox a few things, but his big run uh, in the mid 90s against Shawn Michaels and stuff like that, but we'll get to that. <clears throat> um, super gifted, but troubled. I mean, really, one of my favorite matches, and I'm just going to say right at the top, <clears throat> something you guys need to check out. It was a Raw in Germany. I think it was March 3rd, 1997, if I remember the date right. It was the European Championship Final. It was British Bulldog Davy Boy Smith against Owen Hart. And it was tremendous. It was Davy at a peak. Even though he had <clears throat> his injuries, he wasn't physically what he was, but he could turn it on here and there. And he really was just doing some great shit there. That's one of the best matches of his run, at least on television. <laughs> Maybe he had better matches on house shows. We don't know, because there ain't a lot of footage of those out there. The Talking Heads, no, not the same as it ever was. Same as it ever was. Once in a lifetime. Was Davey Boy Smith a once in a lifetime talent? Possibly. So, Diana, his kids. Um, Harry Smith, by the way, I do want to say, while uh, somewhat athletically gifted, also is a fucking brain sight possessing idiot. He doesn't understand anything about how the real world works. If you get it, you goddamn get it. <clears throat> So, Shawn Michaels weighs in. Uh, Nigel talked a little bit. This is when Nigel was still with the company. So, this was filmed a while ago. Um, you know, Wade Barrett, Stu Bennett, he chimes in. William Regal chimes in. This must have been before William Regal took a sojourn to AEW. And then said, fuck this. And Brett especially weighed in. And I really did enjoy hearing Brett talk. One, Brett is my favorite wrestler of all time. Two, Brett was very close to Davey. Obviously, since Davey had married his sister, <clears throat> married Brett's sister, not married his own sister. They're not the royal family. Har, har. And Brett was very close to Davey. And <clears throat> Brett has said that Davey's death and, you know, a lot of these issues, like a lot of these deaths, um, <clears throat> think is, I, I think if I remember right, Kurt Henning and a few others contributed to a lot of health issues he had. I forget when he had his stroke. I forget if it was 2002, 2003, but I think it was 2002, but I know that he was really having some difficulty, and Davy's death probably didn't help. So the family was in the living room, and, you know, talking about the pictures, talking about stuff, and Davy Boy really did mean a lot. I'm going to say Davy Boy, and I'm going to go Bulldog, because I'm not going to call him Davy, like Diana did, who's a bit of a spotlight junkie in her own right. I'm just saying. Uh, the interview footage that they had of Davey, either from like the mid-90s or even some stuff in the very early 2000s, 
him talking about his troubles, him talking about backstage stuff, talking about road life. It was really nice. And you could tell this was later in his career because he had the shorter hair. Now, it was nice to hear from Davey. I do wonder if Davey had been able to clean up his life, had actually, you know, stayed healthy and hadn't had the heart failure that he had at 39. How long would he have wrestled? <laughs> would he have contributed more to professional wrestling? Would he have stayed, you know, in the background? He could have lived a quiet life. I mean, it's not like he didn't give his blood, sweat, and tears in a lot of years to wrestling. So Dynamite Kid was his cousin. Dynamite Kid, who abused his wife, by the way, and deserved to be in a wheelchair and deserved to end up the drooling vegetable that he did. And I'm glad he suffered the piece of shit. Because he wasn't the only, or rather, his wife wasn't the only one that he did that to. I'm not saying Dynamite wasn't talented. I'm not saying he wasn't influential. But he basically was this shy of pulling a Chris Benoit. So, we get the British indie footage very briefly, and in Stampede footage, Brett talking, you know, about the fact that, you know, Davey was seen as a hot commodity. <clears throat> they talked about, you know, how Dynamite wasn't a very good influence on or around Davey, playing um, tricks on him, x slacks in the coffee, and look... Playing a few tricks is one thing. <clears throat> Dynamite was a stiff river, as the kids say. I don't think the kids have ever said that. Brett helped be a good support system. <clears throat> Him and Diana fell for each other. Davey and Diana, not Brett and Diana. That's very weird. Really should start wording things better. And <clears throat> vice versa. We see wedding footage. And you can tell it was a happy whirlwind romance. And then the Japanese run. <clears throat> and they were all... You know, Dynamite... I worked with Tiger Mask. He was already over as a single. Davey came along. They both got hooked on steroids, a lot of steroids. <laughs> if I remember right, they went to All Japan, and Vince actually had to go talk to Giant Baba to get the Bulldogs back to have them be part of his company. And while he was having the deal with Inoki, he was shaking hands with Giant Baba, his biggest rival, <clears throat> Inoki's biggest rival. I think Inoki and Baba could have had a chin battle and it probably would have exploded the universe. Rest in peace, guys. Nevertheless, you know, they were very over in Japan. I wish we could have seen more of that. See, this is why the two-hour format would have been kind of cool to see. But the Bulldogs did have a good run there. They would make occasional appearances during <clears throat> some Japanese tours events Vince decided to have. And George Scott was mentioned. And fuck that guy. Didn't know how to use Midnight Express or anybody and was a bad booker. He was a lucky booker in the um, rise of stuff, rise of business in Jim Crockett promotions after Jim Crockett Jr. took over in the early 70s or mid-70s. So, March 1985, they we see footage of them in WWF. I believe they were in WWF sometime in 84, and then the aforementioned stuff with All Japan, Baba, all that. And we see a l brief stuff about them teaming up. Getting endorsements like the Hostess spot, that was kind of cool. I miss when Hostess, you know, desserts were good. <clears throat> and then Dynamite got hurt in 1986. It's too damn bad, you abusive piece of shit. Yes, he was influential, but it can't be ignored. We can't pick and choose this stuff. And I'm not saying Davey was a saint. And Davey wouldn't have said he was a goddamn saint. He was in a lot of pain. He was on stuff. He had neglected his family and a lot of that shit. And I don't know what went on between him and Diana behind closed doors, <clears throat> but I think we would have heard about any kind of shit if he had been influenced by Dynamite in that way. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> they mentioned were like, oh, they left shortly after Dynamite got hurt. Dynamite had his back surgery, they dropped the tag titles, they had the six-man at WrestleMania... Three? It was WrestleMania three. I was trying to think of like the timeline. You know, where they had where Hulk Hogan slammed the seven hundred pound Andre the Giant in front of ninety three thousand one hundred seventy three. It's more like seventy eight to eighty thousand. <clears throat> Still an impressive crowd though. They didn't leave until late nineteen eighty eight. That was after Survivor Series eighty eight, <clears throat> the Rougeau incident, where Jacques Rougeau basically got revenge on Dynamite, knocked his chompers out. And Dynamite basically tried to keep Davey under his thumb, and they were working, but that's basically because Dynamite was breaking the fuck down, and he needed somebody to ride the coattails of. And Davey basically decided, that's it, I'm just gonna fucking go back on my own, I'm gonna make it after all, but I'm fucked. I'm sorry, but after that Brett interview, I can't help it. So, October 1990, they talk about how popular he was in England, 
and how popular he was in the U.S., but he was a superstar over in his native land and in other European countries because he was a big goddamn deal. He was jacked up. Not that he was the only one there. He was juicing. So were other people. <clears throat> and Regal Bennett and, or rather Barrett, and uh, Bulldog's sister uh, decided to talk in <coughs> or chime in. It's nice to know that the British tap water had... Uh, you know, no effect on anybody over there. That's mean. I don't know why I said that. <clears throat> I'm, sure she's a, I'm sure she's a lovely human bulldog. Nevertheless, they skipped over, <clears throat> you know, I, I know it's only a one-hour program. This is why I wanted a two-hour format. I like the feud he had with the Warlord, even though, honestly, the Warlord couldn't really move. He seems like a nice guy, but he just couldn't really move. But I like that match at WrestleMania 7. I like the feud <clears throat> breaking the full Nelson. As a 10-year-old kid, you're like, holy shit, this is like one of the best things I've ever seen. Him picking up, and he picked him up. Davey could pick up a goddamn redwood tree if he wanted to. He slammed the Warlord, who was every bit a 330 at that point. Nothing but muscle. And slammed him. It was a big deal. They kept going. <clears throat> He would work uh, European tours, work U.S. tours. He was part of, I believe, a six-man tag, if I recall correctly, of SummerSlam 91. Um, won uh, a 20-man battle royal at the Royal Prince Albert Hall. You, if you have him in a can, you better let him out. <clears throat> oh, no, we have Prince Albert in the can. Yeah, if you don't get that joke, I'm not going to try to explain it to you. He was also a Survivor Series 1991 <clears throat> on, opposite, on the opposite side of a team against Ric Flair. And then after that, we, you know, he had a pretty good run in the 92 Rumble. I believe it was about 26 minutes, if I recall correctly, 30, uh, 26, 30 minutes. Um, he got eliminated right after Kerry Von Erich, who technically never got eliminated from the 91 or 92 Rumble because only one foot touched the ground. Can't help it, guys. I can't. I'm sorry. But, you know, <clears throat> when he could have been a one-legged man at the IHOP serving dishes, it's just funny. Let's get back to the show. So, they go straight to SummerSlam 92. They do talk about how he got injured. He wrestled Iron Mike Sharp <clears throat> and suffered a staph infection in his knee. They didn't really bother to go deep into the fact that he had been doing a lot of drugs with Jim Neidhart, who was having his own issues at that point, and has then passed on. Rest in peace, Jim Neidhart. <clears throat> but... Brett has talked about how he set out this match and everything. He would be in a tanning bed. He'd be laying down. He'd imagine this match. He told Davey about it. And once they found out they were in Wembley, it was going to be a big goddamn deal. They showed footage of the Ultimate Warrior. By the way, I just want to say, for Mr. Quirin doesn't make the world work. Fuck the Ultimate Warrior. I'm glad he's dead. And then... <laughs> British Bulldog is going to win this, whether he wants to or not. That kid was bound to determine he's staring right into Davy's soul. But Brett carried Davy through that. I mean, yes, on muscle memory alone, Davy <clears throat> could do that, but he could do the moves. But he even said, <clears throat> and this is after Brett had explained, Spot's gone over the stuff with him and gone over it, <clears throat> obsessing over it, because Brett crafted this beautiful match. And then they do one of the first moves or whatever, and uh, Davey's like, I'm fooked. Brett, I'm fooked. Because he <clears throat> didn't know the spot. So Brett says it's one of the only times you'll see him talking. They got through the match. Crowd lost it to finish. It's one of the best uh, WWE, not just WWF, WWF, WWE, pay-per-view matches of all fucking time. That's got to be top 20. <clears throat> Possibly top 10. Crowd reaction alone. But that was easily, like, it was a 25 to 30 minute classic. I forget the exact runtime. It was close to that. Brett nearly getting his knee blown out, <laughs> catching Davey doing stuff. Or, you know, having to catch himself when Davey didn't want to catch him because Davey was probably in space at that point. And there's some good shit going on in that match because Brett was able to <clears throat> craft it. Davey got the roll up. One, two, three. Crowd lost it. And then <clears throat> they talk about his first exit. Main exit in November 92, getting HGH from a guy in uh, Britain. This is right when the steroids scandal stuff was happening. The trial was going to be coming up in a number of months or in about a year. And also Ultimate Warrior was getting that. So Warrior was out of SummerSlam or SummerSlam Survivor Series 1992. He should have been out in 1992. He shouldn't have been brought back because he just wasn't that beneficial. That Papa Shango feud, boy howdy. But... Warrior went off and did his own thing, 
like holding up promoters for money and stuff like that because he was clueless. And Davey went to WCW in 1993. This is where I wish, <clears throat> again, the two-hour format. Because he had a great uh, series of matches with Vader. And he beat Bill Irwin at Super Brawl 3. Which was certainly a match, given the state, uh, state of Bill Irwin at that point, who was never really great. He was fine in World Class Championship Wrestling, but he was never really all that great, to be honest. But, I wish they had covered a little bit more of that goddamn run in 1993, because he had some really, really good stuff, especially with Vader. You know, you had Beach Blast, you had, I believe it was Vader and Sid against Sting and Bulldog. Um, yeah, Beach Blast 93. He was part of the Shockmasters debut. Yeah. And then, there was talks of, like, making him a champion of some variety, but it just didn't work out. He had his issues, and also, he wanted to go back to WWF. And I, I don't believe he got involved in anything on the European tour. Like, when Arn and Sid scissored each other, if you know, you know, and if you don't, you are very confused how atomically or ad, uh, anatomy-wise that would work. Atomically, yes, Atomic Arn Anderson. There you go, there's the atom bomb Arn Anderson uh, <clears throat> crossover you didn't know you needed. I'll dig my way out of this. So, he, you know, was involved in the finish or the aftermath of the SummerSlam 1994 Owen versus Brett Cage match. <clears throat> and then was, you know, banged his head at um, Survivor Series 94. And then Owen's like, Mom, that's your son. That's your son. What are you doing? We're backward on Brett in the chicken wing for like about 18 goddamn years. It was nuts. <clears throat> God, that was a terrible finish, but it's so hilarious because Owen made it better. <clears throat> and they skipped over his teaming with Luger, to be perfectly honest, that's probably for the best. They skipped over the Sean feud, though. <clears throat> they skipped over his, you know, <clears throat> in the 1995 Rumble, him being one of the, you know, the first two and the last two. Granted, it was 60 second intervals, so he barely lasted <clears throat> much longer than he did in the 92 Rumble, <clears throat> but he's back. Um, only one of Shawn Michaels' feet touched the floor. Teams of Luger, still doing his stuff, was in the 96 Rumble. Didn't really last all that long as much as I recall. And then I think was part of the six-man tag where he was part of Camp Cornette um, at WrestleMania 12. And then, and then, had that feud with Shawn. It was really good. It was really good stuff. They had uh, In Your House, Beware of Doge. I think that's what it was in King of the Ring 96. King of the Ring 96 was a better match. Diana got involved, spotlight junkie that she is. I wish they had covered a little bit more of that because that was good stuff. And then he faced Sid at SummerSlam 1996 in an underappreciated match. He was also part of Survivor Series 96, and he was teaming with Owen. <clears throat> they were the tag team champions. They were having great stuff. I wish they had been able to show a little bit more of this because... The footage, <clears throat> archival stuff of him with Owen, and everybody misses Owen to this very day. Um, <clears throat> the family, the family movies, that was nice. That that was, uh, you know, some good home movies. And then <clears throat> they skip over Mania 13, where they had a match, I believe, against Mankind and Vader. And they lost the tag titles, I believe, to Austin and Michaels, if I recall correctly, something in mean, June of 97? May, June? <laughs> One or two, I kind of gone blank on a couple things, but then you know, we go to Canadian Stampede 1997, 10-man tag, you know, Austin and his guys, which I believe is Shamrock, Goldust, and LOD, in, <laughs> oh God, at the Canadian Stampede in Calgary, and it was the Heart Foundation, it was Brett, it was Owen, it was Pillman, it was Davey, it was Neidhart, <clears throat> And the crowd would have burned that fucking arena to the ground if they didn't win. If the Hart Foundation did not win, they would have... That that arena, <clears throat> the cars for the boys and the women, would have been burned to a goddamn Luau cinder. I don't think that's how that works. They would have burned everything new, Chris. Half a Calgary might not have been left standing at that point. I'm not advocating for it. I'm just saying those fans would have been fucking pissed. They were shaking the floor cans. They were shaking the goddamn mics. You could... Feel the foundation cracking. It's an incredible atmosphere. It's also a pretty damn good pay-per-view leading up to that, and that's just <clears throat> that's just her cherry on top of it. I don't know what I'm on about, so let's just move on. <clears throat> um, unfortunately, after that, it started to go downhill. 
He was having his issues. <clears throat> One match, though, that I mentioned <clears throat> in the beginning, but I do want to say about 1997. Again, him versus Owen, European Championship Final in uh, Raw in Germany. <clears throat> Fucking incredible match. And then one night only, 1997, you know, where <clears throat> Bulldog had his sister stricken with cancer. Tracy, I believe her name was. I wrote that. Tracy, yes, that's what it was. I <clears throat> write very frenetically when I'm watching the show live. He had dedicated the match to her, and he was going to win. <clears throat> and then Sean came up with the idea to get heat by beating Davey in his hometown. And Sean would return the favor. Guess what Sean didn't do? He didn't return the favor, because Sean was a full-on dick at that point. At that point, I emphasize. Now he uses the power of Christianity to say that he's a good guy. <clears throat> Maybe he is. He tends to book with two different directions in mind, whatever this is and whatever this is. So, <clears throat> it all started to go downhill. The Bret Hart screw job talked about that. Not going to uh, delineate or expand on it. <clears throat> if you know, you know. Bulldog felt the need to have solidarity with Brett, <clears throat> so he left. Because he had been European champion, tag team champion in 97. It's not like he was not riding a high, <clears throat> but he also has issues. His pill issues. Sean talks about that. That's probably why Davey liked traveling with them. Jim Cornette has talked about the fact that Davey sometimes was mumbling to himself because he was on <clears throat> the Somas, the muscle relaxers, to the point that he just couldn't talk. But he was always so fun-loving and so enjoyable to be around Except when he was fucked up, but he just was, uh, apparently he was like just a big kid. Um, so then they show his stuff in WCW. <clears throat> they show him dropping Steve Mongo McMichael in the Power Slam. I know Mongo has issues, and I hope that he can live a full life and, you know, continue to battle the illness he had, has rather. But Mongo was never that good in the ring, so unless you <clears throat> could muscle him up... He had a hard time going up for shit because he was a great athlete. He was not a good wrestler, but he was entertaining. <laughs> but this is the thing that really fucking pissed me off that I wish they would have expanded on. And I mean, they showed some of the stuff he had wrestled in WCW for a little bit. <clears throat> By this point, I think he'd shown him in January of 98. They showed him on Nitro, <clears throat> Steam with Nightheart. He's not really doing much of anything. He's doing more than, he's doing more than Nightheart. Because Davey still had a little bit left. And Bischoff admitted that <clears throat> really it was hard when, you know, it was legal stuff that even if a doctor's handed out and even if you know it's too much, you legally can't do anything about it. And he had a lot of people on the roster like that. And not that he was the only one. Vince had a lot of people too. So I'm not blaming Bischoff for that. What I will blame Bischoff for is the Fall Brawl 98 trapdoor thing. One, he didn't need to go through that much goddamn effort for Ultimate Warrior, who by that point didn't mean fucking shit to WCW. After his debut, <clears throat> it was terrible. It was, I mean, his debut wasn't even all that great because he rambled for 15 goddamn minutes and it was insane. But they do the trapdoor thing. They have the Renegade play Warrior <clears throat> and they get beat down. In fall, you know, through the trap door. And then Warrior came out through the goddamn thing. When he could have just done that anyway. could have just done the smoke thing. And everybody could have gotten scared. And then boom. <clears throat> but no, we have to placate to Ultimate Warrior. Who probably got around a million dollars for about three months. And contributed fuck all the shit to WCW's <clears throat> bottom line or ratings. He definitely didn't increase pay-per-view buys. Like, name <clears throat> one pay-per-view he was involved. He was involved in two, by the way. He was involved in Fall Brawl 98, and he was involved in Halloween Havoc 98. And then he wanted more money when he never fucking deserved it. He was a big star for a brief moment in time, but I feel the need to dump on the Ultimate Warrior. <clears throat> that being said, Bulldog hits a trap door. It was him and Nightheart against Disco Inferno and Alex Wright. Bulldog knew something was fucked up. What the fuck's going on? Boy, that rings really hard. <clears throat> and then Agent tells him, oh, you gotta watch for the trap door. So yeah, it was Norman Smiley and somebody. <clears throat> and I retroviewed that pay-per-view, I think sometime last year. I think. And <clears throat> you can see them avoiding the goddamn trap door because everybody finally was warned about it. Maybe Bischoff actually was a competent leader or had anybody that cared about, you know, Having the safety of the wrestlers in mind, maybe somebody would have said, yeah, by the way, there's a trap door there. Don't do it. Or maybe, here's an idea, don't do the fucking trap door for somebody that wasn't going to mean shit, that was going to be gone within six weeks, whether you knew it or not. There was no point to having a trap door there. You led to the <clears throat> injuries 
have led to further injuries of a particular talent. It could have been bad for everybody. I think Alex Wright even hit it because Alex Wright was holding his back. Disco, I mean, fuck it, Disco Inferno could end up a drooling vegetable. I don't care. The whole point is wrestlers were put in danger simply for a stupid trick on a pay-per-view that was not very good, that pretty much peaked with Saturn and Raven. So yeah, <clears throat> Bischoff and company should have been held accountable for that, even though Davey was fucked up and on stuff. This just made it worse, and it was for a stupid goddamn stunt. And then unfortunately, <clears throat> he was on the morphine. Um, <clears throat> he, um, his sister died in sometime in 99, or sometime in late 98, late 98, early 99. Family videos of Davey all fucked up. He had a rehab stint. He flew over to um, Leeds, I th Leeds, England. I think he's from Leeds. I think that's what they said he was from. He ends up um, trying to carry his mother's casket along with others, and his back gives out because he needs back surgery, and he may never recover. <clears throat> um, WCW fired him in April '99, so I think he was under contract for like what 15 months at the most, <laughs> maybe 16 months. They might have signed him in late 97. Owen basically put him in contact with Vince. And Owen was like, you know, hey, if you can come back, maybe we can team up. And then Owen died because Vince um, <clears throat> wanted to save money. And first of all, Vince resents our tone when we point out the fact that Vince is responsible for what happened, for using the wrong company, for another stupid stunt that didn't need to happen. Owen should still be alive. Owen should still be be able to be with his family. <clears throat> there should be no Owen Hart Foundation in his memory. There should be an Owen Hart Foundation that he's helping to run. And I still hate myself for being angry at Martha for not wanting him in the Hall of Fame until I saw that dark side of the ring. And then I really felt like shit because I don't understand how I didn't see it. <clears throat> but basically Harry got him to where he was back in the ring. Um... You know, and he, Bulldog wrestling in jeans was just strange. But it was like August, September of 1999. I think it was August. Because he was on the Unforgiven 99 pay-per-view. He was in the 2000 Rumble. He was involved in stuff, but he was gone very, very quickly. I don't even remember if he was on the WrestleMania 2000 card. If he was, I think he was in that Hardcore Battle Royal invitational thing, whatever the hell it was. I don't remember him being involved in anything major. And then... He left rehab, feeling that he didn't need it. Diana left him. <clears throat> his daughter talked about his issues, him even falling down the stairs. And he tried to get clean near the end. He had an indie appearance in May of 2002. Harry was in the corner. He's possibly going to team up with his son. And then he died of heart failure a week or so later. And, <clears throat> yeah, the family talks about him. It's just... Um, they talk about Harry Smith carrying on his legacy. Harry wishes he was half of what his dad was in the ring. He's not a bad athlete, but name one good Harry Smith match that has, you know, lit the world on fire. <clears throat> He's an adequate worker. He's kind of like if Eric Watts was related to the Bulldog. Nevertheless, Davy Boy Smith certainly left a hell of a goddamn legacy. And I went long on this because I wanted to talk about some of my favorite moments. So I hope you enjoyed what are some of your favorite British Bulldog moments in the comments? <laughs> Maybe not promos, even never a great promo. But even when he was fucked up, he would always deliver. It's just a shame at 39 years old, passed away. You have to wonder what the future would have held for him. Not necessarily for his career. He might have only wrestled a few more years. But what would his life have been like? Could he have still contributed to wrestling? Could he have just lived a quiet life? <clears throat> and Ban Ambassador for you know, WWE over there in the UK. Possibly. We'll never know. Rest in peace, Bulldog. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Like, share, subscribe, Twitter handle in the description. I'm John Rentlin. I'll see you soon.